I do that. All right, so let's jump into part two of, uh, of this class. I think, I hope everybody has figured out also um, that the, uh, I don't think I explicitly mentioned this the other day, um, but uh, I am also uploading the slides as a PDF. If you go to the, um, you know, week one overview page. As soon as I get my slides ready for a particular lecture, um, I get them uploaded as a PDF, um, which means for a lot of people, if you're taking notes on paper, some people find it really helpful to print out the slides, which can be a lot of printing. Um, but then you can take notes right on the slides. Some people, um, if you're taking notes on a tablet or something like that, you can just write right on them um, with your stylus or whatever you're using. Um, so this, uh, and like I, I did manage to mention that, um, that uh, I do have them all, there will be some repeats. The end of last lecture, for instance, that we didn't get to is the beginning of our slides here. So if you are printing them off, um, you probably don't need to print the entire the entire thing every time because there will be some duplication from, from the slides from before. Um, and if you're doing it all digitally, then, then you don't need to print at all. And then it's, then it's a moot point, right? Um, I also will, let's see, did I did not, um, post this link? Let's see if it's still what's on my clipboard. Yeah. Um, so I will post this link as well. This is, uh, from Miracosta, uh, college in Southern California. Um, that uh, has a step-by-step -step tutorial for using cam scanner. If you're having trouble getting stuff saved as a PDF from your smartphone, um, this is a pretty good resource that has videos on, here's how you scan it as a PDF. Um, how, here's how you get your handwritten assignment as a PDF to Canvas as well. Um, so if, you, if you're having trouble with that, check this out. And if you're still having trouble, then I can walk you through and you can you know, hold up your phone to the screen and show me what you're looking at. And I can maybe help you um, if you're not able to figure it out um, using some of these other resources. Uh, every phone is different. Sometimes there's weird idiosyncrasies that uh, I don't know about or that I just um, have forgotten about. Um, far more common for me to just not plain out not know about them because there's so many different types of phones and whatnot. But um, and I'm looking right now at the um, at the outline. Let me update that since I didn't do that before. Uncertainty and sig figs. So we're going to talk about um, uncertainty and measuring as um, our main focus today, and specifically what we call significant figures. And significant figures, if you've had a, a high school science class, you've probably heard this term before. Uh, it just means numbers that we measured. And they're considered significant because we went to the trouble of measuring them, and therefore we care about them. That means they're, they're an indicator of how good our measurement is. The more significant figures you have, the more effort you put into getting that number, and probably the better that number is as a measurement, the more precise that number is. So we'll talk about that and how all that figures into calculations today. Um, so it's not super uh, engaging material, um, but it's going to lay groundwork for us doing calculations and knowing where to round and things like that down the road. Um, but before we do that, our random random science uh, application today, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the scientific method in general. Um, just as a uh, a brief overview, um, since you guys haven't had a chance to ask any random chemistry questions yet. This will be our, our random chemistry application. Um, so here's a good Albert Einstein quote, as opposed to a lot of the ones you find online that are, you know, the internet is a dangerous place, Albert Einstein um, type quotes. Uh, this is an actual quote by Albert Einstein, um, not taken out of context. Uh, it gets paraphrased a lot. Uh, Carl Sagan has a similar version as well. Um, 
we don't have a perfect understanding of how the universe works, but we do have science, which means we're getting closer and closer, a more and more accurate version of how the universe works with every time we go through um, and, and refine our understanding. Every time we add a new rule to physics, that's giving us a better and better understanding of how the universe works. And that's what the scientific method is. Um, you know, people, science can be uh, misrepresented um, sometimes by, by people that say things like, well, why should I bother paying attention to this? They're just going to change it next year anyway. Um, well, yeah, maybe, but that's how science works. And we're getting closer and closer. I mean, that's, think about that same logic when you apply to flat earth, you know, like, well, okay, they're just, why should I bother learning that the earth is round when now, then they're just going to come back the next year and say, well, it's not really a sphere. It's an oblate, oblate spheroid. Like, okay, but that's, that's closer to being true, right? Than saying the earth is flat. The earth is, is a sphere is still an approximation, but it's a better approximation than the earth is flat, right? Objectively, that's closer to the truth. So yes, we might have to keep refining our understanding adding new levels, um, but we're getting closer and closer every time. Uh, and I just really like this figure as well, especially because it makes the point that you start from an observation and just being curious about it. That's the part that people forget sometimes. Curiosity is what starts the whole scientific process. Um, and then if you can formalize that curiosity and that observation and say, well, I think it's because this, or I think that it'll happen again if I do it this way. And then you test it. And if you're wrong, that just means that you need to refine your initial hypothesis. It doesn't mean that you throw it out entirely. It means maybe there's more details, more variables than you thought were there initially. This applies a lot to statistics, right? When people think, okay, I bet there's going to be a correlation between say the percentage of the country that's vaccinated and the number of new COVID cases per capita. Like, okay, if we plot that for all the countries in the world and we get not a nice neat relationship that we were expecting, that doesn't tell us we're wrong, just tells us that there maybe there's other stuff going on. Maybe it's because the more people get vaccinated, the more people feel um, like they don't have to wear masks anymore. And so, You've got these two competing things, vaccination slowing down the spread, but people not wearing masks anymore, which increases the spread again. Right? So the more of these variables we can come up with, the more we can refine our ideas, the better our overall understanding of the system is. Um, it's also worth noting, because these are also two words that get thrown around a lot by people who haven't studied science, the difference between a scientific law and, this, and a scientific theory. Does anybody know the difference? Scientific law versus scientific theory. It's a bit of a trick question because there's one response in particular that we always hear that's wrong, just flat out wrong. People always make the assumption that a law is somehow better than a theory, is more definite than a theory. That's not it at all. The difference between a law and a theory is that, is that a law describes what will happen, and a theory explains why something happens. So we've got New Newton's laws of gravity just say that an object that's thrown will move like a parabola. But Newton's theory of gravitation is that any two objects with mass will attract each other. The theory of gravitation explains why objects move in a parabola shape, explains why the law happens. They can both be, frequently theories are more well understood and more supported by observation than laws are. There's zero difference, zero connection between a theory versus in a law and how well supported it is by evidence. And that's, that's where it gets villainized a lot because theory in popular word means like, uh, maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. Theory gets used in place of hypothesis. Um, but in science, if you hear the theory of evolution is just as strong as the law. Um, and so the, the law might be considered the law of natural selection and the theory of evolution. 
The law of natural selection tells you what will happen. The theory of evolution tells you why it's happening. So anyway, I, this was the very end of my, um, my uh, teaching philosophy. So I thought it was worth going back to and talking about again, because I do like to throw those things on the final exam as um, something like, explain the difference between the scientific theory and the scientific law is a really is a favorite question of mine because that's kind of forms the basis of you guys being informed um, science educated or well-educated people um, in the sciences. All right, so let's talk a little bit about chemistry specifically. Um, and, you know, I thought about going with the Breaking Bad definition with the, uh, you know, the squirt bottles full of uh, various solutions that you can make, you know, different flame tests happen. Um, in my office here, that would probably not go over so well. Um, but I really don't like Walter White's definition all that much. Walt says it's chemistry is the study of change. Uh, kind of. A chemical reaction is change. But really, you can study something using chemistry understanding and theories um, that's not changing. So it's I, I like it. It's better to describe chemistry as the study of matter. So now we've defined chemistry as a study of matter. That doesn't really help us if we don't have a definition for matter, right? Does anybody know what matter is? Why does it matter? Uh huh. That was pretty bad. Isn't it anything that takes up space? Anything that takes up space? Um, that is one of the two criteria. And so the theoretical physicists will go back and forth as to these things meaning the same thing. Some physicists will say that if it takes up space, it has mass. Or if it has mass, by definition, it takes up space. Um, I'm not going to get into that too much because I'm not a theoretical physicist and say it's but it, they're basically, if it takes up space, it will have mass, unless we're getting to some real exotic stuff out there that might exist. Um, for instance, dark matter in theory could is measure has measurable mass, but we can't observe it taking up space. So maybe dark matter would be an example of something that has mass but doesn't occupy space. But more than likely, dark matter is just something we don't understand yet and it really is regular matter um, that fits both of these criteria as well um, so basically chemistry is the study of everything um, it always comes one of the most common questions i get asked is why do you why did you choose to study chemistry and sometimes it's phrased along the lines of why on earth would you do that to yourself um, and i get that it's not the easiest field to study um, but it does mean we can study anything we can see. Anything we can observe, we can apply chemistry concepts to it and study it. Um, and that, that's one of the reasons that personally it appeared to me, I have a little bit of ADHD and have a hard time focusing on one thing. So what I liked about chemistry is I didn't have to pick one thing to study. I could study everything, um, which also got me into trouble for, for grad school because I had a hard time finishing my project without getting distracted by other questions. Um, but it's also why I like teaching chemistry so much, because we get to talk about all sorts of different applications. So for instance, I know a lot of you guys are um, going into some form of medicine, either dental or PA school or nursing or pre-med. Um, and so one of the things that's really interesting is that chemistry matters to biology because modern medicine happens where chemistry and biology overlap. Our understanding of how medicine happens, how we medicate people, how we develop pharmaceuticals, how we treat disease, is all based on knowledge of chemistry and how different chemicals affect, say, a tumor or a particular strain of bacteria. Um, and so if you don't understand the chemistry, then you have a hard time explaining things like um, why, why hop oils are antimicrobial for gram-positive bacteria, but not for gram-negative bacteria. But if you know the chemistry behind beer, you can explain why hop oils are an antimicrobial for one class of bacteria, but not another. Um, just don't 
ask me anything you want about fear. Don't ask me to define the difference between gram positive and gram negative. That's a better question for Carl, the microbio uh, instructor. Um, but I do know that beer affects them differently because of the chemistry, because of the hop oils. Um, this is a cool little kind of like a, a word web, concept web from, uh, from the, one of the textbooks that I teach um, that kind of shows why chemistry is what is also sometimes called the central science. Um, the, so the central science, it's called that because it kind of links all of the other sciences together. If you want to know how physics affects biology, you've got to know the chemistry. Um, although they're trying to cut chemistry out on that, you can get a degree. And um, if anybody's had Kathy Cox for physics, her uh, her um, PhD was in molecular biophysics, um, which is basically physics and biology trying to cut chemistry out of the loop. Um, but really, all it is is just applied chemistry. They just don't call it chemistry. Um, but so there's a lot of fields like that where if you look at chemistry, it's how you link things. Um, like if you want to understand environmental science and how, say, climate change and, cha and the uh, acidification of the oceans is going to affect something like the geology of the, of the ocean floor. You've got to know the chemistry behind it. You've got to understand that, for instance, limestone is made out of calcium carbonate and calcium carbonate dissolves when you put it in an acidic environment. And so you wind up dissolving a lot of the limestone as the oceans get more acidified. So there's a lot of different connections. And really, I'm, I like to phrase it, and I think this might be my chemistry-centric bias. I like to, to say that you can't really understand anything at an expert level unless you know some chemistry about it. Anything, like if you want to understand guitars, you want to understand electric guitars, you have to, you might, uh, and you really want to be an expert at it, you got to be able to understand why what, wrapping an a, uh, electric guitar pickup in one type of wire versus another, why that matters. Why you use one type of magnet versus another is going to give you a different sort of sound. That's chemistry. Being able to understand that how that matter um, is behaving is related to the chemistry. Um, that's just an out there example that's nothing related to science for the most part. It's also very close to what we call material science, which is anything that's a solid or a liquid. We call um, studying that material science. So developing new magnets, developing new solar panel materials, all that fits into the material science and chemical engineering category. Um, anybody studying something that's not on this chart somewhere? Joe? Wait, I, I can remember yours. Uh, computer science, right? Yeah, that's right. Computer science is a little bit further removed, but computer engineering, on the other hand, that develop, developing the materials we make the computers out of, how do we develop better transistors, smaller transistors, that's getting into the nanotechnology side, which is definitely chemistry-based. Um, how do we make silicon in general is a very chemical-driven process. Um, Mathematics uh, is not that tightly related to chemistry and therefore computer science isn't that close, but it, it's related. There's a reason you're being required to take this class and it's because chemistry touches everything. Anybody else who's got something that's not on here? Speech pathology, that's a good one. Anthropology, all right, a couple speech pathology. Um, pathology in general is going to be somewhat chemistry related, especially if you get into the neuroscience side of things, because we don't know very much about neuroscience at this point, but we know certain chemicals affect how your brain works. And that certain chemicals are tied to um, things like this, the, your, I believe it's your, what, your prefrontal cortex is what controls speech. Um, it's been a long time. I've never had ANP, so I'm really shooting from the hip on that one. I might be way off, but I think it's somewhere in the frontal cortex controls speech. And that's also going to be infected by things like dopamine concentrations um, and you know, various other neurotransmitters. Anthropology is a good one because it's Indiana Jones, right? Physical anthropology is what we call. We don't actually do it like Indiana Jones anymore, but um, there's a lot of chemistry involved in, okay, well, how do we restore this, you know, 1500 year old Viking axe head 
without rem and how do we remove all this rust without removing the paint that's underneath the rust? That's all chemistry related. So a lot of the physical anthropology side is, is related. Um, maybe a little bit less if you go on the sociology side. So yeah, so sociology is, this, we're getting into a good one. I've got another, there's an XKCD for everything. There's that's that uh, web comic I brought up the other day. Um, see if this one, if I can come up with this one quickly. Fields arranged by purity is what they refer to. Purity meaning like how much is it pure measure, pure math measured numbers rather than um, a soft science. So sociology is just applied psychology. Psychology is just applied biology. Biology is just applied chemistry. Chemistry is just applied physics. So the physicists think that they're the, the most pure of the science fields, but then you've got math over here um, way off to the side because they don't care anything about practical application. They just are in, interested in the math. Um, so sci sociology is related once removed because you, if you wanna understand psychology and psychi psychiatry, you've gotta understand chemistry and how things like um, Adderall affect dopamine levels. Um, and then, but if you can understand some of that and then broaden it to apply to an entire group of people, now you've got sociology. Um, the, the mouse over text on this one is really interesting too. It's, it's very funny. It's the comment comeback to, well, physicists just make approximations. They don't actually do math. And the physicists re respond to that by saying, let's see, make sure I get it right. Uh, I think Feynman said this physics, physics is to math as sex is to masturbation. So in other words, yeah, you can do all the pure math that you want, but it's not really what you really want to be doing. You really want it to be applied to something real. Anyway, I just, I find these uh, connections fascinating and I like to link all of these things. Yeah, I think there should probably be a line from chemistry straight to food science too, but I'm not going to get picky. I didn't make the graph, so. All right, let's talk a little bit about how we can start applying some of this really abstract ideas. Um, part of the ways that we differentiate math and very pure just number theory from the real world is the fact that we don't do anything that's just a number. In sciences, anytime you have a number, you have to have context for that number or it doesn't make any difference. What use is a number if you don't know what num what it is? Yeah, you know, if I said, okay, well, what's what's the likelihood that um, it's going to rain today? Three. Okay, three what? Three percent? Three inches? Without context, numbers don't mean anything. We can do math with them, but they don't do anything helpful. Um, and so units are what make a un a number have context. Uh, and so the Wikipedia definition is definite magnitudes of physical qualities, which is, I mean, it's technically correct. I don't like physical qualities in there because you can have a unit of something really abstract. Um, for instance, you can have a unit of magnetism. That's not necessarily a, something physical that you can actually see or, you know, take the mass of, um, but it's definitely something we can have units for. Um, here's better definition. Units tell us what a number means. Without a unit, and sometimes units can be implied. Like if I walk into a, into a gas station and take a $20 bill and put it on the counter and say 20 on, on three, there's two numbers without units, but from the context, the cashier can understand what I'm saying, right? I'm really saying $20 on pump number three. So sometimes you can get away with that, but you can also give yourself a lot of miscommunications if you do that too, right? Um, because what if I actually meant 20 gallons on pump number three instead of $20? Well, I mean, that's partly on me for not using units, um, but you need the units in order to really understand $50 of gas versus 50 gallons of gas. 
Um, if you're taking ibuprofen, Advil, you need to know a dose, right? If I, if I say, you know, oh, if you got a headache, go home and take 400 ibuprofen. 400 what? Tablets, milligrams? Kind of a big difference there, right? So 400 milligrams is a unit. And that's what gives you the context there. That's what tells you the proper dosage. Um, and you can say the same thing in multiple units, right? If, if I happen to know that the average dose of ibuprofen in Advil is 200 milligrams per pill, I could say take 400 milligrams or I could, take, I could say take two pills, right? And I'm saying the same thing in both cases. So sometimes we have units that can be interchangeable if we know enough information. What units do we use for length? I think this is an easy warm up one. Throw it in the chat or unmute. Eight. So what was that? Standard, so inches, feet, centimeters. Inches, feet, yeah. Alan, I think you said feet, right? Yeah, yards. Yards. What if we're not in the US? If we try and tell meters. somebody from France, yeah, if we, meters, centimeters, kilometers, kilometers, miles. Um, astronomical units is a unit of distance, is a unit of length. It's the average distance between the Earth and the Sun is an astronomical unit. Um, light years is a length. Parsecs is a length. Um, so there's a lot of them. We're going to football fields is a length. Why do we have so many versions of the same unit? Leagues, <laughs> I like that one. Now we're getting getting old school. Fathom, um, I don't know any of you who grew up reading uh, Chronicles of Narnia like I did. They always, in, was it Voyage of the Dawn Treader was the one where they measured everything in fathoms. And I had no idea what a fathom was. Isn't like a nautical thing? It's a nautical thing, yeah. It's a, a fathom is a length of rope that's about the height of a person, it's six feet. So two yards is a fathom. Um, why do we, why do we have all these different things? Hands, yeah. Not so. Now we're getting some interesting. Um, we're getting some really specific units. They're specific to a certain field, right? Why don't astronomers use hands to measure the distance from here to the sun? Well. Because that's not very convenient, right? It's really convenient to measure a horse in hands because everybody has a hand. It's not very convenient to measure the distance between here and the moon in hands. Um, and so part of it, we'll talk a little bit um, about this in a second. Um, part of it is that our brains are just kind of hardwired to think in certain sizes of units. Um, basically, it, if you try and picture a number that's bigger than four, four or larger, what your brain automatically does is it turns that into groups of two or three. Next time you try to count a group of people, it's more than three people. You're, if you look at it, what your brain is going to automatically do is going to divide that group of people up into smaller pieces. Because really, our brain can only think of in units from about a quarter of a unit, uh, maybe up to a tenth of a unit, up to about 10 objects. Anything larger than that, and our brain can comprehend it numerically, but we can't really, can't really fully wrap our head around it, which is why we measure the, maybe the distance between, say, my house and LTCC is six miles. I'm not going to say the distance between my house and LTCC is 30,000 feet. Because you can't wrap your head around what does 30,000 feet even look like? If you try to picture 30,000 feet, the first thing your brain's going to do is try and put that into miles or football fields. Right? Because then you're dealing with a smaller number. And so the reason we have all these different units is so that we can try and measure things in units where we have a, somewhere between a 10th of a unit and 10 units. Anything bigger than that, and we, a, our brain just doesn't have the firmware to process it properly, which is kind of fun to think about. And next time, you never, nobody will ever be able to count things anymore without thinking about that. 
at least I can't. And now anytime I count something, I think, okay, oh, that was a group of three I just counted. Um, and you, it's kind of interesting to watch your brain do that and not know that you can't do anything about it. Um, weight, volume, time, those are also gonna have their own units, right? Weight and mass, we consider those interchangeably as long as, as long as nobody's leaving planet Earth, we can use weight and mass interchangeably. Um, there is a difference between weight and mass, but that's for the physicists to argue about. Um, volume, what's a common volume unit? Ounces. Ounces, milliliters, liters. Yeah, quartz. Uh, I like the first verbal one I heard was ounces because that one's confusing because there's fluid ounces, which is a volume, and then there's ounces, which is a mass or a weight rather. Um, so ounces, we try to stay away from ounces as much as possible because it gets very tricky. Anybody who's ever done any baking um, knows that to be the case, right? When a recipe calls for three ounces of something, you've got to decide whether that was three fluid ounces or three ounces on a scale. Um, so we'll try to be specific if we're using ounces, I'll say fluid ounces for volume. Does anybody know where a fluid ounce is the same as in a mass ounce? What substance would we pick to be the definition of both an ounce and a fluid ounce? Any guesses? Gas? Close. Oil, maybe? Oil. Um, it predates our, our need for oil and gas. Yeah, it's water. If you're weight, if you have one fluid ounce of water, it will have the same mass as one ounce of um, by mass, same weight. Um, but if you're weighing something that's not water, then that means that you can't make that assumption that fluid ounces is the same as as um, mass ounces. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, another interesting. Speaking of oil, um, barrels of oil is actually a volume. A barrel has a standard defined volume to it, uh, which I believe is 55 gallons, um, which is why you get, if, you, um, if you've ever picked up a keg from a liquor store, um, that's probably a quarter barrel keg. The kegs that you actually buy that are, you know, 120 whatever beers, um, not that I ever did that in college. Um, but those, those are going to be a quarter barrel. And so when you go into the, if you go into the brewery business, you will, you see, they will barrel things. They will rate their setup in terms of barrels. And then you take those barrels and you put them into quarter, quarter barrel or eighth barrel kegs. Um, those half size ones that you see, they're called, you know, those pony kegs um, are uh, usually an eighth of a barrel, but that's all comes back to the industrial size barrels of oil that you, that you ship things as we have any weird time units out there we all know seconds minutes hours those are pretty standard they don't even change between here and france right the si system still uses seconds minutes hours um technically a year light years light years is interesting because light years is not um, a time, despite having the word year in it, it's actually a distance because it's it's the distance light travels in one year. So it's got a an, a time component to it, but because it's also tied to the speed of light, the time units wind up canceling out, and you get left in length units. Um, days is actually an interesting one. Does anybody know how many days are in a year? It's an easy one, right? 365 exactly. Hmm. If it was That's 365 exactly, we wouldn't need leap years. So it's more like 365 and a quarter days in a year, which is why every four years we have an extra day on our calendar. Because every four years, that extra quarter of a year, a quarter of a day adds up to a day. But it's not even really exactly a quarter of a day. It's 365.24.
days are in a year, which is why every hundred years we skip leap day. 13 moons, moons is a good time unit. Yeah, um, the and 13 moons is about accurate, um, which leads us to once in a blue moon. Does anybody know what that phrase actually means? What's a blue moon? When you have more than one full moon a month. When you have one more, more than one full moon in a month, which if we have 13 moons in a year and only 12 months, means you're guaranteed to get at least one blue moon a year. Occasionally more than that. Um, but yeah, all of these different time units, they all have different origins and different uses too, right? 13 moons is a really good way of measuring time if you don't have a clock. If you don't have a clock or a calendar, 13 moons is a really good way to remember when to plant crops and when to harvest crops, which is why all of our major holidays are centered around equinoxes and solstices. Um, Christmas is right around winter solstice. Um, Halloween and Thanksgiving are right around the winter, they're the um, autumnal equinox. The vernal equinox, the spring equinox is right around Easter because that gave people a way that people that didn't have a clock a way to keep track of the time of the year. What are some other weird things that have units? Not just weird units, but what are odd things out there that have units? Is currency a unit? You gotta, you gotta specify what kind of currency, right? Pesos versus dollars versus euros is all gonna give you very different answers. Music, very good. So frequency of sound is gonna, has its own units. Hertz, right? And Hertz is actually a universal unit that gets used in a lot of places because a Hertz, the official physics definition of Hertz is cycles per second. So in terms of music and sound, that means how many times something is oscillating per second. But in terms of computers, Hertz tells you how many calculations a processor can conduct per second. Oh. Um, and then there's electricity. You got a lot of different units for electricity, right? You got voltage, which we measure in volts for the most part. And also you've got current, which we measure in amps. It's loudness, amplitude of sound in decibels. So basically, if you can, if you can feel it or think about it, scientists have put a unit to it in some way. Um, I think aside from maybe a philosophy, I'm sure I could still find some units in philosophy somewhere. Um, Anything that you can that you can measure for sure, there are units to it. Um, temperature is one that uh, nobody got to yet, but that's a pretty common one. It's easy to measure, right? You might not measure it yourself on a day to day basis, but you care about what the temperature is, what that measurement is. Um, we have common units for pretty much every, every major um, quality that we can measure. And for the most part, we're going to stick to SI units, which stands for System International or something like that in French. Um, and it's what we, what we consider metric units. Metric units are going to be what we stick to in the sciences, um, because for the most part, they make more sense. Um, they're, they're at least related to each other in a more, in a more easy to understand way. Um, growing up in the U S you might know that there's 12 inches in a foot and there's three feet in the yard and there's a hundred yards in a football field. But if you didn't grow up in the U S all of those things are not very well understood. Right. So the metric system measures things and then uses powers, even powers of 10 to convert between the smaller units and larger units in that system. Um, our two major temperature scales are going to be Celsius in metric and Fahrenheit in, in British units. Um, but there are other temperature scales as well. If you're talking about really cold temperatures, if you're talking, some of the calculations we'll do, we don't want things in Celsius. And we'll talk about why when we talk about gas laws. Um, so we put things in Kelvin. 
and which is called considered an absolute scale where abs where zero Kelvin means you can't get any colder than that. Um, you can get colder than zero Celsius. You can get colder than zero Fahrenheit. You can't get colder than zero Kelvin. Um, and there is a similar scale in Fahrenheit. It's degrees Rankine. Nobody ever uses that, um, but it exists. Just so you're aware. All right, let's talk a little bit about. Now we have we have like five or ten minutes, so we're going to take a break anyway. Let's look at some other funny units before we get into the boring stuff after break. Um, if you are unaware of this, you should know that Wikipedia has a really really um, cool um, lists built into Wikipedia that people have spent hours and hours compiling different sorts of lists. So you can do think, find things like Wikipedia, if you type Wikipedia and go lists of lists, uh, you lists, can get lists, lists of lists of lists <laughs> where you can see lists of academic journals. And then within that, you're, each of the academic lists of academic journals is going to have the journals themselves. Um, lists of books, lists of 100 best books, lists of banned books. Um, Lists of demons, lists of deities, lists of philosophers. Um, but you can also find things like uh, lists of uncommon units. And there's unusual units of measurements, and then there's humorous units of measurement. That's two separate lists. The humorous one's more fun, uh, if you ask me. But for instance, you can have the small length of uh, the small unit of very short length, the sort of equivalent to a light year, but very, very short is a beard second. A beard second is the distance that the average person's beard will grow in one second. Is that useful? No, but it's interesting. It's funny. It's kind of derived as a joke. Um, a barn, is an actual is a real serious unit it's funny but it's a real unit and it comes from the phrase hitting the broad side of a barn um, a barn is a unit of area used used by nuclear physicists to quantify the scattering of, or absorption cross-section of very small particles so the odds that a particular radioactive particle will hit the broad side of a barn is literally what this unit is One pirate ninja is defined as one kilowatt hour per Martian day. I mean, some of these are just the physicists messing with people, right? Oh, wh what could we get published in a real journal? I bet we could get a really weird unit published in a real journal. And some of them actually do wind up getting published. A New York second, is the shortest time of unit in the multiverse, is de defined as the period of time between the traffic lights turning green and the cab behind you honking. Um, so with your break, get up, move around, do something, but, uh, feel free to also check out some of these, the uncommon units are the ones that are a little bit more actually useful. Um, and yet, you know, you could actually look at your definition of what is a horsepower and why is it called horsepower? For instance, it's going to be on here somewhere. So let's, let's, uh, call it 215. Let's come back at 225 and we'll get into measuring units. I have a question before we break, um, yeah. just just to, uh, about speaking of journals. Um, how, how can we access some of the uh, journals or what does the LTCC library have um, access to as far as uh, medical journals and such? Do you know or, you know, scientific journals? So I know for a fact we have access to science, which is mm -hmm. is one of the big ones, one of the big two the Access to nature costs um, costs a school. They don't have a uh, pricing option for small schools, so access to the nature family of journals would cost us something like twenty thousand dollars a year. Oh, wow. um, but we do That's have expensive. access to science, and I believe if you go to that, the people in the library um, specifically would be able to help you more. But I do know okay. science in general, we do have access to. Okay. Cool. Um, okay, cool. And I'll you can get access to that from off campus as well. 
to science. Um, we found a way to do that. I can't remember where it is on our website right now, but. Um, All right, I'll investigate further. I just that brought up a, a query in my mind, so. Yeah, no, you... uh, I appreciate that. Thanks. All right, I'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you. Sounds good. So, yeah. Sean, I have one one quick question also. Just yeah. With homework, uh, are we expected to do these homeworks just on a piece of notepad paper and then turn them in as a PDF file? Do you want us writing this information on the actual printouts that you have? Does it, is it? it doesn't matter to me. Okay. I know um, you said you're not really grading it when it's on us, but just to turn in something. So I, I still look and make sure you did every part of it. Um, I'm not going to go through and find, oh, did I freeze or did you freeze? You there? Hang on. I'm not second. sure, but I, yeah, oh, I got you, go. but your video is not there. You're back. Okay. Um, so I'm not picky about it. Take, um, you can either okay. print it off and write on the printout. You can do it on scratch paper and scan it. You can do it all on word. If you want to play with the, the okay. equation editor on word, um, is are all valid, valid options. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank all you. Right. Thanks, Alan.
All right. So for anybody who was interested, I know we're a couple minutes early, um, but for anybody who is interested in finding journal articles <clears throat> from LTCC that we have access to from LTCC, I did find the links for that. Um, if you go to resources up at the LTCC page and go to the library, <clears throat> one of the uh, one of the links on the side is find articles. And from there, it's got all the different databases that we have access to, some of which you can get access to if you're not online. Um, Gina, I was just I was just going through. Um, I did find that page from our website. If you go to resources and then go to library. OK, thank you. Um, and then, like I, I was saying, if you go to find articles, there's all these different databases. There's one for STEM classes or for STEM journals in particular. Not oh, all of so these cool. you will have access to on um, at home, but mm -hmm. we can get you any articles that are on the, these websites. If you go to the library, they can get you access to them. Cool. Thank you. No problem. All right, so let's get back to units a little bit, and we'll start. We'll start by talking about any uh, things that you can measure directly yourself. So, in the strictest sense, a measured number um, is is going to wind up defining what a measured number is. And when you look at a number that you can tell whether it was measured or not, winds up being an important way to determine just how accurate you can be with these calculations. Um, so a measured number is any number where you directly make a judgment using a scale. Um, or a directly any any number in which that uses a piece of a um, uses a measured number as a piece, for instance, miles per hour. You, if you have to measure the distance that you go in an hour, that makes speed a measured number, even though the hour, we might consider the hour to be exact. So these measured numbers are any, anytime there's a judgment or any amount of uncertainty in your measurement, that's a measured number. Um, so length, volume, temperature are all things we commonly measure, but there are lots of other measures out there. Speed is a measured number. Time is a measured number because you can never actually have something take exactly one second. I mean, what? I mean, you, you could, but you're never gonna be actually able to tell if it took exactly one second, because if you get out a stopwatch and try to stop something at one second, you're never actually gonna stop at exactly one second. And so time is always gonna be a measured number. Um, so these, these different types of scales that we have are going to determine how good our numbers are. For instance, if we if you look at A and B here, if we have the same piece of wood on two different scales, we can we can have different level of accuracy because all we can really tell from A is that it's between four and five. But if you get more accurate scale, we can get a lot more specific with it. It's not just between four and five, it's between 4.5 and 4.6, right? So cho the choice of measuring implement is gonna wind up making a difference too. Um, go back to the measuring time analogy. If you're using your wall clock that doesn't have a second hand, the best you can do is, is get something within a minute, right? But if you have a stopwatch out that goes to a hundredth of a second, then you can measure how long that time takes a lot more accurately, or a lot more precisely anyway. One of the reasons that, that the uh, British units, imperial units get um, villainized so much and rightfully so is because they don't use the right type of scale. Not only do we have to deal with the weirdness that is there's 12 inches in a foot, we don't even measure things in decimals for inches for the most part, right? If you go to the hardware store and you buy a tape measure, it's gonna you're gonna have something in fractions of inches. Um, and so they call that a fractional scale, where you have something where you can measure 
three and a half, three and a quarter, three and three eighths, three and five sixteenths, three and six sixty fourths. Um, all those fractional scales are a pain. Nobody likes fractions, right? In fact, most people's most traumatic primary school experience with math was probably with fractions. And I think fractions get a bad rap from that a lot of the time, but when it comes to doing math in the sciences, um, that bad rap is deserved. Fractions are just painful to deal with. They're helpful for thinking about things in your head. They're not useful for doing math. Um, so we're gonna stick to decimal scales. And the difference between these is that a decimal scale is uses only base tens. So it means that we're not dealing with halves. We're not dealing with quarters. I guess we could deal with a half because five tenths is a half, right? But every time you have markings, if it's a decimal scale, you're going to have nine markings in between these. You'll have 10 equal sized increments from one unit to the next unit. So you can have a, an inch, a uh, tape measure in inches. That's a decimal scale. You would just be measuring things at 3.2 inches, 3.4 inches instead of three and a quarter inches. Um, and and uh, American engineers use those all the time. They American engineers still do things in inches, but they don't use fractional scales for it. They use all decimal scales as well. And so, so the only difference between a decimal scale and a fractional scale is that in a decimal scale, everything is 10 equal increments. So you're always going to be writing down your numbers in decimals rather than fractions. Um, and we are only going to use decimal scales. I might refer to things in fractions as a way to visualize things. Because if I say, um, you know, one out of every three people, that's a useful fraction when it comes to visualizing something. So we might use it in that sense, but we're not going to use it in, as far as any measured numbers. All of our measured numbers are going to be in decimals. So remember, be like, be like Drake, fractional scales, decimal scales, right? Decimal scales is what you want. Um, and sometimes that can get really tricky because sometimes it, if you have a fractional scale, you can't use it. You basically have to pretend those markings aren't there. We're basically going to ignore anything that's not a decimal scale. And that includes if you have markings that go every two instead of every one. So if you have a, a graduated cylinder that's got markings for every two milliliters instead of every one milliliter, that's not a decimal scale. You have to treat that like it's a fractional scale. You have to ignore everything in between tens of milliliters then. You can use it to help you measure something, but you can't write it down. And we'll go into the rules for that in a second. Um, and so our official rules for measuring things is that you, you write down the most accurate number. You write down all the numbers you know with, with absolute certainty. And what I mean by that is that every single person who looked at that measurement would write down, would absolutely agree, for instance, for A, everybody in the world, we can assume, um, is going to agree that this piece of wood is between four and five centimeters. We know that with absolute certainty because we can see it. We see that the wood is somewhere between four and five. And nobody would ever dispute that, at least not if they're acting in good faith, um, which opens up a whole nother can of worms. If, you can, if you're debating with somebody and they're gonna argue that that's not between four and five, it's not worth having that debate. Right, so let's say all reasonable people acting in good faith would agree it's between four and five. And then we estimate one spot past that, one decimal place past the number that everyone agree on. So most people would get close to the same number for that estimated part. So for four, if we're looking at this, we could look at this and say, okay, well, if it's Right here, that looks really close to really close to halfway between four and five, right? So everybody would agree it's between four and five. And then we might disagree a little bit. Is that 4.5 or 4.6? And so that's the last number you write down as you estimate one decimal place past what you're sure about. 
right? And that's why having a better scale changes things, right? Because if we look at B, let's assume it's the same piece of wood. Well, now everybody looking at this can agree with absolute certainty that it's between 4.5 and 4.6, right? Nobody's gonna disagree with that. Nobody's gonna look at this measurement and say it's 4.7, right? everybody can say it's definitely between 4.5 and 4.6. So those are the numbers we know with certainty. We know with absolute certainty that it's between 4.5 and 4.6. So in other words, it's 4.5 something. So if we know it's 4.5 something, we're just going to estimate one spot past that. And that's where we might argue with each other. Like, okay, well, I think it looks like 4.57. Somebody else might say, I think it looks like 4.55 or 4.58. But we're always going to write down that estimated spot because then that allows us to say, okay, whatever, whatever number you have written, the last decimal place you write has some uncertainty associated with it. And we can even quantify that uncertainty. Say, okay, well, Looking at B here, it's, I'm going to say it's 4.57, but I might be off in that hundredths place, right? And so I can write that down. This four, it's definitely between four and five. It's definitely between 4.5 and 4.6. So these numbers are absolutely certain. And then that last digit, is where I estimated, is where I have some uncertainty. So the last reported number is always going to be assumed to be plus or minus one in that decimal place. I know I'm not off by a whole tenth. I know I'm not off by a whole centimeter, but I might be off by a hundredth of a centimeter. So, and we can write the uncertainty. We can say it's 4.57 centimeters and the way we write uncertainty is you write plus or minus with a, a plus with a minus sign below it plus or minus 0 0.01 centimeters hang on i can zoom in real quick and make my whiteboard bigger All right so we can we can write in the uncertainty here explicitly, but if everybody's gonna follow the same rules for writing down measured numbers, we don't need to write this. If everybody follows in the sciences, follows the same rule, then we don't need this at all because whatever the last number is that you wrote, that is where the uncertainty is. Unless somebody specifically tells you otherwise, you can assume that you're always plus or minus one in the last digit that's reported. And this applies to anything digital too. Um, if you've got you know, uh, your Fitbit, for instance, it's tracking how far you work. Do people still wear Fitbits? I feel like that was a sort of a flash in the pan a, a couple of years ago. Um, but whatever sort of like run tracker or something like that you use for, for calculating how far you've gone on a hike, if, you, if you're pay attention to it, it gives you your miles to the hundredth of a mile. It doesn't usually go to a thousandth of a mile because the uncertainty is in the hundredth of a mile. You could be off by a hundredth of a mile. So it won't report numbers past that because what it's really telling you is that's where the uncertainty is, in that hundredth place. Same for bathroom scales. Bathroom scales that weigh to the to the pound versus a tenth of a pound. A bathroom scale that weighs to the, to the pound is plus or minus a pound. If it reports to the tenth of a pound, then it's plus or minus a tenth of a pound. All of this stuff is programmed into it by the engineers and the software developers who write this because they all follow these same conventions as well. So it's a very powerful tool to know what the uncertainty is because that tells you just how much you can trust this. Um, if you buy really cheap electronics, they might, you, you know, if you bought a knockoff Fitbit that tracked your, uh, your distance that you went, um, 
then you might get, it might be plus or minus a mile instead of plus or minus a hundredth of a mile. Like that's not very accurate, right? All of a sudden you can see why that one was so cheap, right? Because plus or minus a mile is not as good. You wanna know with more precision how far you went, right? So, and that's, that's why getting good, um, getting good tape measures is really important. That's why you could get a really expensive tape measure at the hardware store or a really cheap one. Um, I made the mistake of buying a, uh, a level at the dollar store. Say, I can get a level that has a ruler on it for a dollar. The inches are way off. I tried to use it to measure. It's off by like 10%. Um, it's off by like an inch out of a foot. Because um, you get what you pay for, right? The uncertainty is way higher than that. And it wasn't designed by engineers. And so it's got way more markings than it should, considering how far off it is. All right. So this is why we care about these, these rules that seem very nitpicky. Well, they're very nitpicky because this is what allows us to do things like um, fire a probe off from from Florida, have it land on Mars with no input from NASA in real time is because they're careful about how precise their units are. All right, so to recap, read the most accurate. So for A, read the most accurate number you know with certainty before, estimate one more decimal place. If you have a better, keep skipping forward for B. Um, if you have a better scale, then that just means you can write more numbers with certainty and you can be estimating one spot further. All right, so the scale uh, in any of these, the scale is gonna determine how many numbers you can write down. And that's what makes them a significant digit or a significant figure. We frequently abbreviate that as sig figs because significant digit is a mouthful. Um, so sig figs is how many numbers we write down. And that's a measure of how good our, our measurement is. So let's define a sig fig. It's not, there are ways of, if we are looking at somebody else's measurement, we need to know which of those numbers count and which ones don't. So in, or, in, in addition to having rules for writing down measurements, we also have rules for reading measurements because in the sciences, we like rules and procedures that are nice and uniform for everybody. So we're gonna, here's our definition of sig figs. A digit is significant if it, as long as it meets one of the following criteria. If it's non-zero, if you have a number written down that's not zero, it's a sig fig. It counts because at some point you went to the trouble of measuring that number. So it matters or somebody did. So 5.3, 5.13 centimeters. That's three sig figs. Right. All three of those digits were measured. If it's a zero at the end of a decimal. Like this. That zero at the end of the decimal, that's not going to make any difference when we plug it into a calculator, right? So the only purpose for writing it is to indicate that that's where the uncertainty is. If something looks like it ends right at one of those lines on your scale, then you can put a zero for that place. We would write the zero to indicate, hey, I actually looked and it's plus or minus one in the thousandths place but it looks like it's really close to 3.3 or 5.31. So I'm going to say 5.310. That zero is serving a purpose. It's communicating to the reader that that is a sig fig. So this would be four significant figures, all three of the non-zero numbers, and then that last zero at the end. Right, scientists in general, and we, I think we uh, went over this in, on Monday, people are lazy. Right, and scientists are just very efficient about being lazy. So if a scientist write, writes down a number, it's because it matters. And so you, you should strive for that as well. 
if you write down a number, it's because it matters. It's because it's a sig fig. So that's also what we call a trailing zero. A trailing zero is anything at the end of the number. If you have a zero that's between non-zero digits, like 5.04, that zero was measured, right? This saying it's between, we know with certainty it's between, um, it's between 5.0 and 5.1, it's 5.04. So that zero was measured as well. Right, so that would be three sig figs. Right. Before we get into scientific notation, I'll just um, make a blanket statement. The only zeros that we would write down that don't count are if they're leading zeros. Zero, so if this is a trailing zero, a leading zero is anything that's to the left of, not to the left of the decimal place, to the left of the first digit that you write down. So for instance, go back to the whiteboard here. So if we had something that was, I don't know, um, zero, you read that, that color is hard to see. Where did I put my black pen? 0 0.0520 0 meters. That's a trailing zero. That one counts as a sig fig. These two are both non-zero. They're both sig figs. Even though this zero is behind the decimal place, it's still to the left of the first measured number. So both of these are considered leading zeros. And these leading zeros, even if they're behind the decimal point, a leading zero is not a sig fig. Right? So only the zeros that are to the right of the first non zero number count. And right? so the only reason that leading zeros are there is to show you where the decimal place goes, right? They're not measured numbers, but that zero is not showing you where the decimal point is. That zero is only there to show you where the uncertainty is, which makes it significant. Very fine line, but the, the general rule is if it's to the left of the first digit, it doesn't count as a sig fig. If it's to the right of the first digit, it counts as a sig fig, okay? And then the, the foolproof way of knowing for sure is if it's written in scientific notation. If it's written in scientific notation, it counts full stop. So if you write 5.0 times 10 to the fifth centimeters, both of these digits are the coefficient, which means they're both significant figures. The only reason you write something in the coefficient of scientific notation is if it's a significant figure. The five in the exponent doesn't count. Because just like the leading zeros, that's only there to show you where the decimal point goes. Right? Think about scientific notation. It's that power on the scientific notation that shows you how many spots over you have to move the decimal point, right? So all of the, the 
power is doing, all the exponent is doing in scientific notation is telling you where the decimal point is, which means it's not a significant figure. All right, so, and I'm, I'm just going to be upfront with you. Um, I will I very rarely make absolute statements or guarantees, but I guarantee this will be the number one thing I mark you guys down on this quarter. Just across the board, this is going to be the thing that's tricky for everybody consistently. The good news is once we get the rules down, other than the part on the final where I'm actually testing you specifically on, is this a sig fig or not? It's going to be very small deductions. Right, so if you're doing a 10 point calculation on the final and you mess up your sig figs, that's going to be minus half a point out of 10. Right, so for the most part, I care about can you can you do your calculation, but the very end, you still have to be able to round it to the right spot. And if you mess that up, it'll be a half off half a point. So it's not the end of the world that this is confusing and really nitpicky and based on semantics that are hard to wrap your head around right now. Um, because just remember, this is something you should always be thinking about, but don't let this trip you up when it comes to getting you know, your homework problems done. Do the best you can on this. Remember that what you're supposed to be showing is where the uncertainty is. If you do the best you can with this, and most of the time you're gonna get it right, and you'll get, get it wrong maybe you know, 20% of the time. Um, and you'll still be close at that point. So again, I'm just trying to re, I'm not trying to, um, you know, break your spirit by telling you, you will miss this. I know you will. And know it's just like, it's, I know you're going to miss it, but it's not that big a deal. Right. We have to spend time on it because it matters. Isabella. Um, can I ask a question here really quick? Please. So for um, example three, um, the 5.04, if that five was a zero, then there would only be one significant figure in that number. Okay, all right. Bingo. And that all of a sudden changes how good of a, of a measurement it is. And, and think about it realistically, if you're trying to measure something that's five, centime five centimeters and you're 5.04, that's a pretty good measurement. You can be pretty confident about that. But if you're trying to measure something that's less than a centimeter with a with a yardstick, you're on the, you're not. That's not a very good measurement, right? So it makes sense why when you start measuring really really small things, you have fewer significant figures, fewer digits that matter. All right. Any other questions? right at this point, or should we do some practice? We'll do some practice and then that'll, that'll help you uh, elucidate your questions. So if I say that the speed of a major league fastball is 48 meters per second, which is pretty accurate, that's a, that's a pretty good fastball. How many significant digits are there? It's two, it's plus or minus one meter per second which seems reasonable. That seems like a, a reasonable amount of uncertainty, right? If I said that a major league fastball was 48.012 meters per second, might, that should raise some red flags, right? Because that's, that's telling you that it's only off by at most 0 0.001 meters per second. That's not probably realistic for most people, right? So, Keep in mind when people write lots of digits, that either means they were very, very careful with how they measured it, or they're trying to sell you something. There's, they're, it's not a great measurement, and they're trying to make it seem better than it is. Um, 40, 343.29 meters per second. How many sig figs there? Five. All five of those count. But 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Three. I like that I had three different ways of holding up the number three on my screen at the same time there. Um, my daughter started counting backwards on her hand. And so she would always write, this is three, this is two. 
No idea. Actually, she was giving me the horns for two for a while, which I encouraged, of course. And just every time it just makes me think of that scene from Inglorious Bastards where there's three whiskeys the wrong way. And then it's a bloodbath because it's a Tarantino movie. All right, so significant figures when it comes to scientific notation, it might take more work to write things as scientific notation, but it's a lot easier to tell just how many sig figs you have. Especially if we have an, this is what's called an ambiguous number. An ambiguous number means you don't know where the uncertainty is. If I write 53,700 milliliters, that could be plus or minus one milliliter, it could be plus or minus 10 milliliters, or it could be plus or minus 100 milliliters. So unless I specify by either writing out the uncertainty, so if I wrote 53,700 milliliters plus or minus 100 milliliters, then that's no longer ambiguous, right? Ambiguous means that you're not sure. Right, it means it could be more than one possible answer. Or you write it in scientific notation. This is why we write things in scientific notation, partly so that we can wrap our heads around how big it is or how small the number is, but more frequently, it's so that we can say where the uncertainty goes easily. Because if I write down 5.37 times 10 to the four milliliters, that tells me the uncertainty is where, is where the seven is. It's plus or minus one in that place. So it's plus or minus 100 because that's the last digit I wrote down. Right, so scientific notation winds up being very helpful that way. And if you get, if you're, you wind up doing a calculation, um, we frequently will do calculations that come up with really, really big numbers or really, really small numbers in chemistry. Um, and if you want to indicate the right number of sig figs, the easiest way to do that is usually to do it in scientific notation. So for instance, if you happen to look up and do some conversions and find that it's um, 997,900 feet from LTCC to Golden Gate Park, where's the uncertainty there? Well, Generally speaking, what we do is if you're not told where the uncertainty is, you assume that the last non-zero number is the last sig fig. So if we wanted to write this in scientific notation so it was no longer ambiguous, we would write 9.979 times 10 to the, and then we would count how many spaces over it moves. So the decimal point starts here, one, two, three, sorry, one, two, three, four, five. So 9.979 times 10 to the fifth feet. And then all of a sudden that makes it clear that our uncertainty is in this last digit. Right, so the other, uh, just, and this is a minor note that, I, that I'm going to give you guys as far as when I'm writing questions and typing things, um, I will usually not put a space between the number and the unit go that goes with it, um, which is a personal preference thing really, because, but for me, I think that that makes more sense because otherwise um, Word or PowerPoint will split it up into two lines all the time. And then you wind up with a number without a unit over here, and then the unit is by itself over here. But if you don't put a space, then it doesn't do that. So if it looks funky when I write things sometimes, that's usually what I'm doing, is I'm just smooshing the unit onto the number so it won't get split up. How about this one? Kilometers to the nearest star. It's a lot of uncertainty on this one. It's a 
it's a, a well-measured number, but at the same time, we could be off by as much as, let's see, there's millions, there's billions, could be off by as much as 100 billion kilometers based on the number that's reported. But if that's what the, if that's what our measurements, our calculations, and the rules that we will learn tell us, that's that's what we have to write. So 4.07 times 10 to the 3, 6, 9, 12, 13 kilometers. This is oh no, you're right. Okay. Um, and the, if we have something that's really, really small, here's another notation here. And actually, I frequently what I will do is instead of putting a comma, if it's behind the decimal point, then by tradition, we don't put a comma every three digits, which means it can be very hard to count how many spaces you need to move. Um, but what you see science textbooks doing a lot is every three spaces behind the decimal point, they'll put a space. But that's still kind of hard to see sometimes. So sometimes I'll use an underscore to, just to help you count how many digits, how many places we need to move the decimal point. So if we have a dust mite, that's 0 0.000305 meters long. 3.05 times 10 to the negative four meters. Right. And so the way to remember if you're if it's supposed to be positive or, or negative, 10 to a negative number is a really small thing, right? 10 to a positive number is a big thing. So if the number you started from is a big number, then it should then you should have a positive value here because you're talking about a very big number still. It's a it's key to remember that scientific notation is not a conversion. We're not actually doing any math. We're rewriting the same number in a different format is all we're doing. So if you started with a big number, it should still be a big number. If you started with a small number, it should still be a small number. Right? So this comes down to you need to um, do what, what I call a reasonableness check. When you write down an answer, look at it and think, is that close to what I expected? Or is that a big number or a small number? And if it doesn't match with what you should have or what you think you should have, then either your estimate in your head is wrong or you did something wrong on the paper. But either way, it should be a red flag and you should stop and think about it. Right? So every time you write down a number in this class, do a reasonableness check. Even when you're writing things from the problem statement, because you know, at least a couple people every single year mess up an answer on the on the final exam because they just didn't write down the number from the number above them, right? And it's off by a huge amount. Or they'll write down a conversion that says something like there's a hundred meters in one centimeter. Like, that should raise some red flags, right? If you're paying attention and then you write down there's a hundred meters in one centimeter, whoa. And that should show up too when you, if you're trying to convert miles into meters, and you know, five miles into meters, and you come up with something like 52 million meters in one mile, you probably messed up something in there. You need that internal reasonableness check. And that applies to just to writing things in scientific notation as well. If you want to know if you did it right, Give yourself a reasonableness check. Is that supposed to be positive or negative? Well, is it a big number or a small number? The other place that scientific notation is really helpful is that it allows us to do um, math in our head really easily, at least simple calculations. So for instance, if we have a diameter of the sun, in kilometers and the diameter of Earth in kilometers, and we want to know how much bigger the sun is than the Earth. Well, we could do the math and figure out exactly how many times larger it is, or we can say, well, 
these coefficients are close to the same number, aren't they? The only thing that's significantly different here is the two, the two exponents. And those exponents are different by two powers of 10, 10 to the two different, right? Which allows us to just look at these two numbers and say, well, 10 to the six divided by 10 to the four is 10 to the two is left over, right? In other words, the sun, the diameter of the sun is roughly a hundred times bigger than the earth. Without ever getting a calculator out, scientific notation allows us to get a ballpark answer. So that then if you turn around and plug it into your calculator and get a better number, that allows you to do your reasonableness check. If you plug this into your calculator and you got that the diameter was, um, was the same, if you got that the, then that means that you plugged something into your calculator wrong. Or if you got that the sun was 10 million times bigger than the earth, that tells you you plugged something into your calculator wrong, right? So having that reasonableness check and, and knowing how to look at scientific notation and do that is a really helpful thing to do. Um, it's one of those, they call that a, a back of the envelope calculation. Meaning like if you wanted to get to a rough answer for how many trees are there in the Tahoe Basin, you could do a back of the envelope calculation and just grab a piece of scratch paper, make some wild assumptions and get close to the right answer. Um, at least within a power of 10, right? So those back of the envelope calculations wind up being really powerful too, um, as far as being able to sort of make, figuring out what kind of assumptions are reasonable to make. All right. So let's look at some, in instead of just counting significant figures, let's, we also want to pay attention to um, where is the uncertainty? Because that, that will also tell us, that tells us something different, right? The more sig fig something has, the more trouble you went to to measure it. But sometimes you still care about just how far off your answer could be, right? And so sometimes we care about the uncertainty more than we care about the number of sig figs. So for these two, let's say we measured the same object and we measured it with a really rough, method where we got 3.0 times 10 to the 2 inches versus 3.01 or sorry 301.24 inches let's do the one that's written in standard notation first where is what is the uncertainty on this number where the 4 is right is that doesn't mean it's it's plus or minus four, it means that it's in that hundredths place. So it's plus or minus 0 0.01 inches. I've gotten much better at writing with a mouse, but it's still pretty bad, um, which is why I go to the whiteboard more often than not. Um, so the, the, uns the way we'd, I would phrase this myself is, you could say the uncertainty is where the four is, um, but probably the more accurate way to say it is the uncertainty is in the hundredths place, right? Because then it's specifically saying 0 0.01 in that, that spot in the number is where you could be off by a digit. So where is the uncertainty if it's 3.0 times 10 to the two? The tenths. It's the tenths the way it's written in scientific notation, right? But if we wanted to write that in science in uh, standard notation, that would be three hundred, right? Three point zero times ten to the two, which means the uncertainty is still right behind the three. Right, so if the uncertainty is still right behind the three, the uncertainty is right here in the tens place. So it's a, it's a little bit of a tricky question. This is one of the reasons why we stick to writing things in scientific notation is because it's easier to look at this and say, well, that's where the uncertainty is. 
which puts it in the ten tens place when we write it in standard notation. So for this measurement, we could be off as much as 10 inches in either direction. For this more accurate, more precise measurement, we're plus or minus 0.01. And this is these two methods, either checking where the uncertainty is or counting sig figs are how we know where to round when we do a calculation. A lot of times, especially in chemistry, we can't directly measure anything that we care about in chemistry, because if we're trying to talk about individual atoms, we're not measuring those directly. We're measuring a mass, which we can then convert into something, which we then can convert into actual atoms. Um, and so all of those different math steps, we're going to wind up with numbers on our calculator that are not exact, which means we need to know where to round. And so the rules um, for knowing where to round your numbers from your calculator are based on either where is the uncertainty or how many sig figs did you start with. So for adding and subtracting, is the one that makes the most sense. It's the one that intuitively we can wrap our heads around why it makes sense. When we add or subtract numbers, we the result has to have the same uncertainty as the least certain number. So the, the example I always give for this is if your friend is driving to Tahoe from San Francisco, and they call you from Placerville to say, hey, I'm gonna be 15 seconds late because I got stopped at this stoplight in Placerville. Is that significantly gonna change their ETA? No, because you already had more uncertainty in the number that you started with than what they gave you as, the, as their adjustment, right? We wanna keep the same uncertainty as what we start with. So for these two numbers, let's say we had for some, some dumb reason, that dumb reason being that I wanted to come up with an example where I could show you this. Um, you measured one piece of wood with a good ruler and then a separate piece of wood with a crappy ruler. And we wanna know what the length of the, those two lengths are added together. So let's say we looked at these and we measured them out and we got our top piece, of wood we measured out to be 4.56 centimeters. Then we used our crappy ruler and we got 3.0 centimeters on the bottom one. If we want to know what the, the sum of these two numbers is, well, our, our bad measurement could be off by as much of a, as a tenth, right? A tenth of a centimeter, which means when we add these together, we could be off by as much as a tenth. So when you plug when we plug the, this into our calculator, we would get 7.56 centimeters, right? 3.0 plus 4.56. But we need the uncertainty to be in the tenths place. So this is how we know where to round. This is we're going to round wherever we need to so that the uncertainty is in the tenths place. So when we round, we would get 7.6, we're gonna follow the same rounding rules that you learned in, in elementary school when it comes to rounding. If five and up, you round up. If the following number is zero to four, you round down. Right? And so this would be the number we would actually write down. We would actually write down for our answer 7.6 centimeters which seems like we lost some precision, right? And we did, because we added a crappy number to a good number. When you add a crappy number to a good number, you get a crappy answer. You don't get a good answer. Right? So, and that applies to, this is adding and subtracting. Anytime you're adding or subtracting, your answer could be off by as much as your least certain number. And sometimes that means that things look a little bit weird. So if we added 5.33 and 4.53, 
But in that case, we're going to get when we plug it into the calculator, we'll get what, 9.83? 9.8. Okay, good. Um, put a number behind it. Do we have to do any rounding there? What's the uncertainty on both of our starting numbers? Hundredths and hundredths, right? And then our calculator answer also goes to the hundredths. So we're good in this case. We keep all the digits from your calculator. And, and so anytime I ask a math question, um, feel free to unpause and, and yell out the answer. I'm not usually going to get my calculator out. And so I'm going to do math in my head. And I, I like to try to race you guys. Um, and so I frequently will do it wrong. And that's uh, somewhat by design because I found there's no better way to get you guys to unmute and give me the right answer than for me to write it wrong. Um, so feel free to correct me when I do my mental arithmetic improperly. Um, that's the point. If we do 6.0 gallons minus 0.08 gallons. 5.9. Yeah, our calculator answer would be 5.92 gallons, right? But we need the uncertainty to be in the tenths place. So we would round that to 5.9 gallons. Three point one oh one meters minus point one two meters. Get what two point the calculator answer would be two point nine nine nine. No, it's gonna end in a zero. Nine nine zero? No, oh, it is not. No, Somebody correct me on something. Should be three point zero eight no, no, three point zero eight nine. Well, you're subtracting a whole tenth of a meter, and it's 3.1 to begin with. So oh, I think yeah, it's you're less right. than three. Yeah, it'd be 2.9. I can't borrow in my head. Um, 10 minus 8989, eight, maybe? Yeah. That's uh, something close. That last digit's not going to wind up mattering, right? Because what are we going to immediately have to do? We got to round to the hundredths place get something like 2.99 after we round, right? All right, I'm immediately going to go back on my word and check this because now I have to get the right answer in my head. I think it's 2.981, that's what my calculator says. Okay, 2.981. There we go. That seems more reasonable. But we need to report it to the hundredths place because that's where uncertainty is. So it just becomes 2.98 meters. This one I can do in my head. 12 minutes plus 0.19 minutes. Calculator answers 12.19 minutes, right? Where do we have to round for this one? What's our least certain number? The hundredths. What's the hundredths here? That's, but that's more certain. If 12 minutes, if I write it as 12 minutes, that's plus or minus a minute, right? Uh, I guess it's the whole. So if it's plus or minus a minute, that means we got to round our final answer to the ones place. So sometimes we wind up with the same number as what we started with. 12 minutes plus 0.19 minutes is still 12 minutes, which seems weird, but this is the equivalent of your friend calling you from Placerville, right? I already thought you were getting here at 8.30 and you called me to tell you you were going to be 15 seconds late. Great, you're still going to be here at 8.30 as far as I'm concerned, right? The uncertainty is, all, is larger than the adjustment. All right, I know I only have two minutes left. 
but I'm going to show you this slide and go through it real quick so that you've seen it, and then we'll go over it again next Monday. For multiplication and division, sometimes we wind up getting, oh, thank you, Allison. I just saw that you were uh, putting the right answer in the chat for me. Um, for multiplication and division, sometimes we wind up with numbers that are way bigger than what we started with or way smaller than what we started with. And in that case, it's not, we're not going to keep the same uncertainty as any of the numbers we started with necessarily. We're going to keep, because our uncertainties wind up getting multiplied as well, right? Which means we can wind up with our uncertainty changing as well. So this is where counting sig figs comes into play. For multiplication and division, we want our answer to have the same number of sig figs as the least certain number we started with. So for instance, if we have a box and we measure it and we do the same dumb thing where we, actually this, it works in this case, we use the same ruler to measure all three sides that goes to the hundredths place in all three cases. We have four sig figs, four sig figs, and then three sig figs. This three sig fig number is our least precise number because we have the fewest sig figs on it. So when you do multiplication and division, we're going to keep the same number of sig figs as our least precise number. So we wind up with a number that's way bigger. Our, cal our calculator answer for this one has lots of decimal places, right? Because that's how multiplying decimals works. You get lots of decimal places when you multiply decimals. In order to know where to round this, we're only going to keep three significant figures. So it's we're not looking at where the uncertainty is for each of these. We're going to look at how many sig figs we have for these. So our volume in this case, and I really need to go back and change these numbers so it doesn't come up with something that's an ambiguous number. Um, it's 550.42416 centimeters cubed. We're only going to keep the three sig figs. So 550 plus or minus one cubic centimeter. Right. And then, um, Actually, I think the reason that I originally kept this in here is this is the shorthand to get around having to write out something, a small number in scientific notation, is if it's plus or minus one, you can just write that decimal place at the end. And that decimal place is indicating to the reader that it's plus or minus one. That's not the officially correct way to do it. Um, you may have learned it that way in high school. Uh, it's it's a, it's a cheating a bit really this number should be written in scientific notation to be as correct as possible. Um, but that's a lot of work considering all we really want to write is plus or minus one centimeter cubed. So you can just put that decimal place on there to indicate that it's plus or minus in one in the ones place. All right, so more practice with these on Monday and we will get to some more fun calculations. Um, if you have lab today, then, uh, take, take a 10 minute break. Let's say that, uh, let's come, come back at, uh, five minutes late to lab since I went a little bit over, um, come, come at, uh, three give everybody a chance to stretch your legs a little bit before we go in for lab. And if you already had lab this week, feel free to join us if you have questions. Otherwise I'll see you on Monday. Thanks. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Have a good weekend, everyone. Quick question. Um, yeah. How do we know which day is our lab day? Because I've showed up on Monday, but I just wasn't sure if that if we have like how to find the assigned days. Um, so if you go to Passport, where you go, um, where you would go to get your webmail, mm -hmm. um, and uh, go to where your class schedule is. So for me, mine since I'm faculty, mine shows up differently. Okay. Um, so. But it'll sh it'll say either Chem one hundred dash o one or Chem one hundred dash o two. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. And it looks like what's your last name, Callum? Uh, McKee. Yeah. So you are registered in Section Two. 
Okay, so officially gotcha. you're supposed to be on Wednesdays, but it doesn't really matter for this class. If you got time Mondays, feel free to keep coming Mondays. No, no worries. Thank you very much. No problem. So it's all right if I, I accidentally went to the Monday one. So it's all right if I don't go to the Wednesday one. Yeah, you only need to show up today if you have questions on something. That's going to be the case for for all of them since we don't have, um, you know, like lab capacity or anything. So you're, okay. you're good to go. Sounds good. Thank you. No problem. See ya. If I was in um, 01, but I missed the lab on Monday, can I still come to this one? Yep. Yeah, cool. normally I'm a little bit tighter on that when we actually have to all fit inside the same lab. But since everything's virtual this quarter, that's totally fine. Come to whichever one you need to or both if you want to. Sweet. Thank you. No problem. Uh, professor, a uh, quick question. Because uh, I, I missed the lab on Monday as well. And by the way, I just wonder uh, if we take the lab still in the same Zoom or there's another Zoom room. There's a there's a different Zoom link. Um, if you go to to the Canvas shell, um, here let me go back to screen share. Um, there's our, our lecture link, and then there's section one and section two. And so okay, Wednesdays sure. is section two. Thank you, Professor. See you later. See ya. Anybody else have questions? Just waiting for me to end the lab or the uh, lecture. Um, I have one about division of sig figs. Is that a possibility? Yeah, hit me. Um, yeah, so on the homework, <clears throat> uh, the third one on part one, I just don't remember exactly how to divide big numbers like that. So the, the key with scientific notation is that you want to make sure that you put enough parentheses on there because it's really easy. Um, if you don't have the parentheses, your calculator usually treats multiplication and division like they're the same step in PEMDAS. Um, and so if you put, if you have, um, you know. What if I was trying to do it by hand? Like pretty old school in that sense. Um, if you're trying to do it by hand, then you're looking you're, at it now i realized i could just type that in and it would give me integer but i was trying to do it like you know 1.5 times 10 to the third over that number essentially so you can do it by hand if we want to say uh, just these two numbers that i made up um you can do these two divisions separately you can do 2.0 divided by 1.5 and that's going to give you your no, new coefficient that's going to be what 1.3 and then i just do three minus two right and then you would just do three minus two so you get times 10 to the one so you you absolutely can do that um some people struggle with breaking them up like that they mess up the steps and that kind of thing and if you put it into your calculator properly you should be able to do that. If you type in, if I if I typed in 2.0 times 10 to the 10 to the 3 in parentheses, and then you just did the division symbol and then in parentheses 1.5 times 10 carat 2. That should give you the same answer. So it's good to have two ways to do this for your reasonableness checks, right? So you should get something that's like 13 when you do this, because it should be 1.3 times 10 to the one. Um, if you plug it into your calculator and you get 13, then that means you did it properly. Um, so while you're getting used to it, I would recommend having two ways of checking it um, until you get used to it, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> so then like on number three, what I just do 1.15 minus the 2.5 and then take that integer divided by the 4.45. Let me, let me look at the numbers because I'm, I'm not good at hearing numbers and being able to visit them. So part one, number three. 
Yeah, that's the one that we just kind of worked out. Um, and yeah. then part three, I just use PEMDAS. So I would just do the top and then whatever that equal divided by. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right on that, on part three. Um, do that and you can, um, I would do that. Doing scientific, doing subtraction with scientific notation can be tricky if they're not the same base. So what I would do if I was trying to do that one in my head or do it on paper, is I would convert that 1.15 times 10 to the 15 is really the same thing as saying 11.5 times 10 to the 14, right? I can move one of those powers of 10. And then you can, when you have the same power, then you can just do the subtract the coefficient. So you would really get something like, if I was doing this you know, in my head, I would turn it into, 11.5 times 10 to the 14 minus 2.0. So it would just be like nine over that integer base. And then you just, you know, compute that into your calculator essentially. Bingo. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you. No problem. Anybody else? All right. Well, if you do have more questions and I haven't gotten to you yet, or if you want to ask me one-on-one, -on -one, come to the lab and I can, I'll open up breakout rooms and you can ask me in private if you want. Or I'll assume that you guys are just dozing off and not realizing the class is over. So I'll go ahead and shut this down.